meeting is now streaming live on Facebook. We are live, and oh, I, right. I, I want to welcome you guys. Um, I was out uh, making money all day. I'm, I'm guessing everybody was, and that's what we want to talk about tonight. We want to talk about kingdom economics. I think we, you know, when we when we set up these meetings, it takes us a little while, and so we can tell how hot the episode's going to be by how much banter there is from the get-go, and I, I have expectations that this should be a good one. Um, I'm guessing, you know, the entry point is Uh oh, we lost him. At least I did. Whatever Jesus is saying in the Sermon on the Mount. Still, did I cut out? Yeah, you cut out. You're describing the entry point. Uh, been such terrible problems with my internet lately. Whatever Jesus said on the Sermon on the Mount got that. Whatever Jesus said on the Sermon on the Mount means something for his disciples. Like we have to be serious about what he says and he says some really significant things about money he says it's the root of all evil um he he talks about giving he talks about uh laying up treasures on earth where moth and rust does corrupt and and that there's an exhortation to do it in heaven so so um give a little background and then we can round table that I, I, I come from an upper middle class home. My dad was a businessman and I grew up in a very stable upper middle class home. Um, but then I lived on the streets for, for a while in my youth. And, and over most of my life, um, I've been very much a part of, by American standards, the, the bottom rung of the socioeconomic ladder. Having a lot of children and, and, uh, moving a lot and not focusing career, focusing on family and church has has left me with most of the life, most of my life, um, living off of pretty meager wages. Uh, that's changed recently in the last few years. I have my own business in Boston now, and I do better than I ever have. But I never felt like, for all of my lack of of financial stability, that I suffered. I I I feel like. I always have more than I needed, almost always. And and that means sometimes we paid our bills as the money came in, and sometimes we weren't coming from, but, but I never felt like I lacked. You know, we traveled all over. I always had a phone. I, I've never not been able to feed my children. Uh, sometimes that meant growing a garden to get it done, but it, it always happened. So I come from that. I froze again. We can hear you. At least I can. Yeah, I heard you up until you said I froze again. Yeah. Well, I come from that end of the spectrum, and I've always taken Jesus's words pretty seriously that that we have to, his teachings about money have to mean something. I, I'll tell you this. I was at a pretty radical anti-capitalist phase most of my young Christian life, and I still have a lot of sympathies there. But moving to Boston and being around Finney Caravella is one of the things that's changed my outlook quite a bit on finances. And it hasn't changed so much my perspective as much as I'm much more willing to concede the idea that someone can have money and do right by God with it. Uh, I can tell, tell you all, for those of you that don't know Finn, um, who runs a, 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 a mutual fund, I think fund, some kind of fund, investment fund that he lives a simpler um a simpler life than 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 i do in most respects when i met him he didn't have a thing on his walls i, I have much more style than finney in my home furnishings and clothing and all that kind of stuff so I, i've really watched him live uh, as a man that could have much more than he does uh in a very humble and gracious way and i know that it's a benefit to the kingdom of god so seeing that you know when we were all young poor kids it was it was cool and it was easy to just think ah, nobody should have any money um mm -hmm. but seeing everything that's happened with the church and with sattler and the things that i've witnessed since we've been here i've maybe changed my my parameters some so how about you guys where do you jump off yes this so, is go ahead 
I'll, I'll follow Titus. Yeah. Uh, come behind me and rebut what I say. So when I was in the Beachy Church, just an, an 18-year-old kid um, at Calvary Bible School, you know, hanging out with other young people. And when we first started getting interested in the kingdom of God, when we first started actually talking about God outside of church, was which was kind of an unheard of thing to do, um, this was one of the main things we started talking about. It, it, it felt like this was like the first thing that God was revealing to us that was a problem in our churches. And we got really passionate about hating money, basically, um, at least hating materialism, because it, it seemed like everyone around us was just like not of the world in a lot of ways, very separate from the world in a lot of ways, except when it came to finances. Like, um, And I think it, it in, in conservative Mennonite churches, I think materialism can be even more of a temptation because, you know, they don't have television. They don't have a lot of things that other people have that other people kind of pour themselves into um, for entertainment or whatever. And since conservative Mennonites don't have that, the one thing they can do is make a lot of money and have a nice house and have a perfect, uh, per perfect landscaping and especially pour a lot of money into uh, equipment for work. So that's something that can be excused because, oh, it's an investment, which sometimes it is. Like I have a business and I understand that. But a lot of times it's just an excuse to have nice stuff. Um, so we saw a lot of this happening around us and we're reading the words of Jesus. And especially we're learning about poverty in the world. And that that's really where this whole conversation becomes important to me is when we look at poverty around the world. When, when you look at the fact that, I don't know what the latest stats are, but around 20,000 children will die today from starvation and preventable diseases. And so when you start seeing that the rest of the world is in such desperate need, and then and, and you look around us and we just, all of us have way more than we need, um, that's a real ethical dilemma. And then when you, so, so we were looking at the world we were looking at the scriptures and we were looking at what the, the Christians around us were pouring their entire lives into. And we're saying, this is wrong. Like that, that was one of the primary things that um, we started to feel was really important to start speaking out about. Um, and so I went through this phase where, you know, I, I wouldn't buy anything or I tried not to buy anything I didn't need. Like I remember my boss going in, into a little convenience store and, and getting a $2 drink and me not buying a drink and him kind of looking over me and being like, yeah, that could have fed uh, a little kid, a bowl of rice in India. Couldn't have it. And I looked back at him. I said, yes, it could have like, it's super judgmentally. <laughs> um, I, I, it was very simple. It was a very simple calculation for me. This money could feed starving children. And um, so I'm not going to spend it on myself if I don't have to. I remember buying ramen and disgusting tombstone pizzas. That's literally a brand name for pizza, by the way. And like all the cheapest food I can as soon as I moved out of the house. Um, and then I would, I would try to find organizations to give to that would um, specifically go to saving the lives of starving children. So there's this cam thing, which I know we're all big fans of cam now um, called save a life where you could specifically give to this part of cam and supposedly would save kids lives. And so I went through that whole phase. And I really enjoyed it. Like it was, it was really important to me. I think it was good. And then um, when I met Brenna, my wife, um, that kind of changed a lot of things. I had to rethink a lot of a lot of these ideas. And I'm a, I'm quite a bit less extreme than I was then. Um, but yeah, that's kind of been my journey with it. And I think that the radical words of Jesus around money are just as radical as, as what he said about loving your enemies, about divorce, about all these things. But unfortunately, Mennonites at least completely explain away these teachings. Um, so that's that's my soapbox. Yeah, I guess. Um, yeah, this is uh, is a fairly um, pretty intensely personal discussion for me. Um and I, I guess for I guess for a number of reasons that I don't even know 
Um, it's kind of like one of these octopuses. You're armless and octopus. You're not. You're not really sure which which arm to grab first. Um, I. I, I want to start out by saying, you know, what you, what you were saying earlier, Titus, about money, you know, disliking money or whatever. Um, I, I feel like your issues, like I would agree with a, a large amount of what you're saying, but I, I feel like you're kind of misplaced because um, what those kids over in whatever need or those organizations that are feeding those kids is money so that they can feed those kids. Um, yeah. And if you yeah. don't have, you know, if you don't have money, if you're not making money, you don't have the ability to help those kids out. Um, but anyway, that's something we can kick. That's dogs we can kick later on. I want to start out by just talking about my own personal experience. Um, so my dad was in ministry um, for basically as long as I can remember. And I have no idea what, um, you know, figures or whatever, except that I know that um, I had left home at the age of 18 before my dad made over $30,000 um, in, in a year's time. And so I grew up like, I mean, we were the poor people in the, in, in the church. Like um, my parents were incredibly frugal. Um, they were also very extremely financially responsible. And of the brothers in my family, I kind of got the double portion of my dad's spirit. I've been in ministry um, of one kind or another. Um, I know you guys are homeschoolers, so maybe uh, teaching school doesn't count, but <laughs> to me, I'm that's not, ministry. And I'm not a my, when my wife and I got married, um, the year we got married, we made $15,000 that year. Um, and we look back now and we have no idea how we did it. Um, I have no idea how we made ends meet on that. And so I've been on the side of it where you just wonder where the money's going to come from. And every time you go to the store and you got to buy whatever my wife did the whole um couponing thing you know and and you worked you know all the time looking for deals and specials and this that and the other um to make ends meet and so getting into a position where i don't have to look at my wife and um and you know she's got to decide what she's gonna do she's um she sometimes has back issues and stuff and um, needs a chiropractor treatment or a massage or something so that she doesn't have headaches all the time. And there's this time the money is not there. Um, there has been, it's been better in the last couple of years, but you know, there's time that the money's just not there for her to be able to do that. And she's got to deal with it. And um, so I get kind of ouchy um, when, uh, when I get, and I'm not accusing you of this Titus, but, um, just the overall tenor that I get from some quarters, when I feel like people who are, um, I go to church for instance, and I'll hear these things from people that I know are probably making twice as much money <laughs> as I'm making and telling me that I'm being greedy because I want to make more money because I'll be honest, I'm, um, I don't make enough money. I like to make more, um, because I have a family that I want to take care of. And I think, yeah, it is possible to be obsessed with money. And I've seen the things that you've talked about, Titus, the, um, you know, we're going to spend all our time. Okay. We wouldn't waste God's time and God's money on TV or whatever, but we're going to spend the same amount of time and the same amount of money um, working on a, on a huge house and gardens and this, that, and the other that are going to burn up just the same as your uh, late model Corvette is going to. So that's kind of the, the perspective that I'm coming from, as well as just simply, I, I've never seen a good, um, a good way that the world would work without people. So, you know, here's a person that has money. Well, then they give jobs to other people, and then those people are able to feed their families and so on. Um, and I realize I, I kind of think about third world countries. Um, there's people over there that there's no, they're, they're unquestionably being exploited by American capitalism. But on the other hand, so we say, okay, we're not going to exploit those countries. Then they lose their livelihood altogether and they still starve because it, and, and maybe there's stuff I'm missing, and I, I'd be glad to hear from you all what perspective I'm missing there, but it seems like 
we live in a really messed up world and obviously economic stuff you know is really super messed up but it feels like just refusal to make money or refusal to spend money um isn't really going to solve the issue of the fact that there's people that are hungry so anyway I'd like to get to I'd like to get to economic systems because I think I think the, the Christian worldview has something to say about those. But let's put that off for the moment. I guess what I would what I would want to hear from you, Dave, regarding regarding your your where you're coming at from these things is how how I guess what I'm always looking for is how are the words of Jesus hurting you in regards to economics? Because I think they're designed to cut at us. So where are they cutting? in your life now are you what are what are you saying like as far as as i'm living my life where are they impactful where where is it where is it costing you something as a disciple to to heed jesus's words about economics i guess the what i've always seen is that um i've i felt from the time I was, I can't tell you how young, probably six or seven years old, maybe a little bit older, I've always felt the inward drawing towards service, that I was going to, that I was going to be involved in some type of service to God. And for a while, I thought that meant a call to preach. Um, I went to Bible college to pursue um, uh, a degree in pastoral ministries, which is what my undergrad is in. I thought I was going to be a, a pastor in another denomination, uh, the Lord made it clear that wasn't the direction, but I've always um, kind of like my dad accepted that I'm probably going to have jobs that don't make as much money. And I'm, and I'm just simply not going to that, that the call of God on my life is not going to be to go and own a business and be making six figures or, or whatever. And I, I guess that's, that's where I've seen it is just simply, I'm going to be one of the ones that has less as a result of of service to god and you know i'm gonna do my best to support my family in spite of that but that's that's kind of what i i guess where i would see the the cutting across or whatever so i i want to come back to to one can we can we let can we round that out with anthony before we move on sure go Yeah, I have a lot of thoughts on what both, all of you said, but I'm not sure how to organize them here. But I think there's definitely a, it's, I, I think I, I can relate to Titus's journey a lot in my younger years. I, um, you know, in my, in my teens, I, I rode a bike to work uh, four miles each way until I was like 19. Um, and gave, uh, we did the typical old fashioned Mennonite thing of uh, giving most of my money home to my dad that I made until I turned like 18 or even until I turned 21. Um, but even then I, 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 the, the little bit that I kept was way more than I spent on myself and I would donate it to causes I believed in and then ride around on my bike and I felt you know I I, I had this mindset that um I kind of looked down on people that had to have a lot of things and spend a lot of money on themselves and and I also uh yeah I would say I kind of my family story was a little bit like like Dave's as well in that in that uh we moved around a lot. My dad, you know, got decent jobs and, you know, was, was industrious and everything, but he was not an entrepreneur and we often were short on money. And uh, I feel, you know, I, I sort of, um, I don't think I was as naturally in, as industrious as he was. And, and we definitely, you know, scratched for money the first quite a few years of our marriage. Um, and, and it, you know, a whole other part of my story is that um, I lived in intentional communities for the first, actually for the first several 
four or five years of my marriage. Um, so we were managing money corporately uh, rather than as individual families. And when I, when we did go to, when my, we did find ourselves in a situation where our finances were independent. Um, yeah, I, I, I know what it's like to be always short, to have to decide, you know, what import, which important things you're going to spend money on. And, and it's, it's a, it's a kind of, it's a cramped feeling. I, I know that we're supposed to have a mentality of, of abundance about our lives. Um, and, and I've tried to have that, but it's a little hard when you have credit card debt. Um, and you're, you know, if you begin to behave in an abundant manner, um, <laughs> you're, you're just going to add to that. And at some point you're going to have to face reality. So, um, so at this point, you know, we, we have, a couple of years ago, I switched jobs um, in order to do something that that I had an opportunity to do something that would make quite a bit more money than what I was making. And, you know, for the first time we can, you know, I have the confidence that if some emergency comes up within reason, I can, I can meet it. I'm not going to have to go into debt to do that. Um, and that's a really freeing feeling. And I, and I, and I'm navigating this experience of being able to spend on things we don't absolutely need without feeling like we're being wasteful or something, um, you know, and understand what, what it is to live, to live frugally, to put the kingdom first. Um, when you, when you have enough, when you have a little bit of surplus resources, when you have a little bit of money in the bank. And so and I also recognize that the immense good that can be done with, with um, money. I guess, obviously, there, there's. I, I think this is a distinction that's really important, that important to make. And I think, for some reason, it tends to get missed in these conversations. And that is that some of you, have, some of you have alluded to it already, but. The idea of making making large amounts of money, I don't think, is condemned anywhere in the scripture. Um, the the capacity to the capacity to generate wealth ha has a lot of potential for for making good things happen, but but it's I think we need to be incredibly skeptical of that capacity. I think people who have that capacity and who are doing that well need to watch them with their own hearts really, really well and need to be watched by the people around them. Um, it's, it's a form of power and any form of power that someone possesses makes that makes them dangerous to themselves and to their community and requires extra checks and balances and accountability. And so, and so, I believe that wealth can be managed well if it's if it's if it's being handled wealth in the sense of of large earnings can be handled well if it's if within the context of a healthy community and accountability outside of that context i think there are very few people who have who have just the strength of of will to resist the corruption that comes from from that much power to be able to, you know, when you when you can just generate money from anything you do, um, that's that is power that gets you connections with people who can do whatever you want for for you and who it, it makes it makes the people around you want to please you. It it makes it just it just distorts your relationships in so many ways that that it's the I think probably the biggest problem we have right now. To, to address in the church, in my experience, is not the issue of money itself, but the poisonous, um, I think it's the issue of capitalism, just to sum it up. Um, and I've got a definition of capitalism here, an economic system characterized by private or corporate ownership of capital goods, by investments that are determined by private decision and by prices, production, and the distribution of goods, that are determined mainly by competition in a free market. 
So, I mean, to break, to, to simplify that, I'd say basically it's, it's the idea, aside from the question of what economic system is best for a nation, the, the capitalist mindset is a mindset that says things that generate lots of wealth are inherently good. Things that don't generate wealth are inherently not valuable. You can, you can, you can, the market will determine what's valuable and what isn't by rewarding it monetarily. And when you have that mindset, and that is the, the, the water we swim in, in this, in this country, um, that really, really damages the, it, it eliminates the church's ability to have immunity against the dangers of, of wealth acquisition and the, the risks, the risks that are associated with, with, large incomes and the potential to generate wealth. If we have bought into this, what, what really is a religious mindset of idolatry um, toward the power of the market and the power of money to automatically somehow on autopilot create good in the world. And we don't, and, and we're not viewing it suspiciously and understanding that we are responsible to engineer the way money is used so that it does good if we don't have that suspicion and that accountability around, around wealth, it's guaranteed to destroy us. And so wealth, I, I would say we need to separate wealth from the capitalistic mindset. Wealth can be a good thing. A capitalist mindset pretty much guarantees that wealth will be destructive. Yeah, I don't have a lot. Well, can you guys hear me? Am I loud enough still? Okay. Yeah, you sound I, good now. I don't have a lot of um, insight into economic systems or capitalism versus socialism or anything like that. However, I, I did want to – maybe we can get into that later. I wanted to come back to something you were saying, David. Um, so, so my little spiel was directed toward Christians who are pouring their entire lives into generating wealth and then maybe giving 10% of it away but living very lavishly off the 90%. That was who I was directing that to. Someone yeah, well, it's like different yourself, than saying money's evil. <laughs> yeah, I was, be I was being a little over the top when I would say things like that. Um, although You were hoping you, know, you were going to stick to that story. <laughs> yeah, I mean, my, I, I, don't, I don't know. If, see, if, if it's a that, useful corrective. But if, if the phrase mm. money is evil makes people really upset, then I might wonder mm. something. <laughs> Anyways, so someone like yourself, David, who is, who is pouring their lives into service and because of that doesn't have a lot of money or doesn't even have a lot of money to give away, that's great because your, your life is obviously being leveraged for the kingdom. Mm -hmm. Or someone like Finney or someone else who's wealthy who's making a ton of money and then and living off of like what the average American lives on or less, kind of like what Rich Mullins did. Um, and is giving the rest to charitable causes or to mission work or anything like that, that's also great. So I think those are the two options or some combination of those two things mm -hmm. for Christians um, in, in relating to money, of course, while not neglecting our families, while being cautious about the dangers of money, like you were saying, Anthony. Um, so I have no issue with, with making a lot of money. What I have an issue with is spending a, a lot of that money on ourselves now that's relative that's just like modesty like what's a lot of money i obviously spend money on myself and recently i spend more money on myself um than than i need to um and so that that's you there, there's obviously no certain number um that that's the right numbers like forty thousand a year or thirty thousand whatever there's there's not a number like that um but but when someone is making like three hundred thousand dollars a year and is giving away thirty thousand of it and living on two hundred seventy thousand, I I have no problem saying that's wrong. I sincerely think that's wrong. I'm not saying they're going to hell. I just am saying that they're disobeying Jesus in that situation. Mm -hmm. um, now all the Dave Ramsey people who are all into the whole like if you give ten percent away then that's the only thing that matters, or um, yeah, uh, you can come at me. I'm fine with I, I that. I would take it. I would take it one step further, Titus. I would say that the desire to be 
wealthy, the desire to have luxury mm -hmm. is a sinful desire. Like there's, mm -hmm. I think that, and I don't know how to, uh, like a lot of the most important things in the Bible, I don't know exactly how to draw a line around that definition, but I know that there's, but that there be dragons. Like there's a place out there when you're pursuing uh -huh. wealth that is sin territory. And, and that, that when you motivate your life towards wanting to be wealthy, wanting to be completely established, wanting to have no problems, wanting to make sure that the barns are settled and everything's going to be okay in my life and I don't have to have any worries or concerns, that, that there's something about that that God doesn't want his people in that disposition. And so, so one of the remedies for that is, is radical charity, radical distribution for people who have a, a high amount of means, the, the curative is, is to be a radical distributionist. So I think that's the, that's where I, that's where I draw one of my lines is, can we say it's a sinful desire to want to be rich? Because Paul says who some coming after many coming after have made shipwreck of the faith. Like, Mm -hmm. it, it messes you up if that's if that's how you're operating your life but and once you can be again, very poor and do that. That. you can be very poor and buy a lotto ticket every week because you're just possessed by the idea of wanting to be rich mm -hmm. so what is i mean and i'm not i'm not trying to be um you know difficult here but um i just think for example you know we're sitting here um when it's you know where i don't i don't know what it was today it wasn't so hot but a couple of weeks ago you know it's 90 degrees outside and you know you can come in into the um the air conditioner into a lot of people that is that is luxury um and honestly if i was broke enough that i couldn't afford an air conditioner that'd be something i'd aspire to so right. you know is is it something that um this is something I guess I feel like is missed in a lot of these discussions that I see is I see this generalization. Um, and I, I, and what I feel is I mentioned um, Kantianism and I might come back to that a little bit, but um, I see this, this generalization rather than a, let's talk about some principles. Let's talk about some things that Jesus did say about the hold that wealth has on us and all these different things. And then, um, and then like people need to be considering what's too much for them. Um, and I just, here's another dog that I want to kick and I, yeah, I'll just say it. Um, we knew somebody a number of years ago that um that was given something that was very nice a piece of furniture it had some had some ornate carving and so forth on it and because it was so nice and it was a luxury he took a saw and cut off the ornate parts of it um so that they wouldn't be living in luxury um and personally i just think that's i think that's ridiculous i don't i don't i don't see the point of doing that just because um, and so when I hear these type of things, I've, I've had friends, I've had acquaintances with those kind of things. And um, when I hear those type of ideas coming, those are the things that I always hear in the background. But then I know you guys, and I know that's not what you're, what you're driving at, at least it doesn't seem to be, um, from having interacted with you for, well, for the last while. But um, that's, yeah, that's kind of where I'm coming from. So I guess you guys have some responses, so I want to hear them. Well, back when I, we were really on a, a radical money-hating fling, my siblings and I would, if we'd see a little, really junky table or something, we'd call it a kingdom table. Um, so I think that's kind of what you're talking about there. Uh, but back to the air conditioner thing, I think that this is that there can be an analogy can be made between that and modesty. So everyone go back in the archives and and listen to the the four guys talk about women's clothes for two hours uh, in the modesty discussion as well. <laughs> so modesty Don't is obviously that. relative right so how what what's modest are pants modest uh three quarters of us on here think so or are at least open to the idea of, of that being the case um but it's obviously relative however one thing wear pants 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> what, what, what does the other person wear a tunic? Um, so, but nice. one thing I, if I remember correctly, Matthew, in, in that episode, you were saying that even though it is relative, the Christian church should be able to make some standards on it. Um, uh, and and your standard being that women should not wear pants, which is an arbitrary, um, unbiblical one. So I, I would say that the now picking I, too many fights. <laughs> this is a, yeah, that's this way is a too really many long checks way of, for you to be able to cash. This is a long way of making my analogy. In in that it, with, with money, you can I throw agree. tattoos on the end of that thing, then we'll yeah, be right. all tattoos, Our tattoos luxury thing of Trouble all the kids that those could be. Actually, in India, you can get good tattoos for like fifty dollars. So if you're gonna get a tattoo, I would recommend going somewhere like. How that. many yeah, meals would that buy, that, Titus? Then the tattoo artist goes home and he buys groceries for his little starving kids. So exactly there you are. Um. So w the same thing with money. So is the person aspiring for air conditioning? Is he desiring wealth? Well, is the person desiring a private jet? Does, it, in, in one sense, it's the same. We're, both of those people are desiring an unnecessary luxury. However, it's, it's not the same. And I think we all know that in the same way that if, if someone was walking around in a, a bikini, we could probably objectively say that's not modest, right? And so there comes a point where something is not modest there comes a point where something is overindulgence. Um, and I'm, I'm saying this is just me, but if you're making 300,000 a year and giving away 10% of that and living on the rest, that's the equivalent of walking around in a bikini and saying that you're, you're dressed modestly. So, so if I could just throw in an, a mental model here that I think really, it helped me to frame these questions in a way that I think is more helpful than throwing out numbers. You make more than so much. Um, then, well, that's obviously excess. And then we, you know, st start to try to narrow it down. Um, this can also be abused, but it's a, I think it's a really helpful place to start. And it comes from Gary Miller. Um, and he says that, that, we should think about money rather than in terms of, of, you know, how much is okay to keep, how much is, you know, how much, how, what percentage should we spend? How far, sh you know, should we live in a, should we live in a junkie house or a mobile home or a cardboard box? You know, how much do you have to deprive yourself before you're not keeping too much instead stepping outside that whole paradigm and asking, um, what are the opportunities that are available to me? Um, thinking, thinking of wealth in terms of the opportunities it gives you for the kingdom of God. Um, and if your mind is geared toward the kingdom, I think ultimately that's really, that, that's really at the heart of this. Um, some of these things we're talking about as symptoms of the heart, and maybe none of us can judge that for anyone else in except in more extreme situations there might might be easy but but kenneth copeland if if well he listen he he got a deal on the jet that <laughs> he couldn't really pass so up it would not have been good stewardship to let it go <laughs> um, to me, anyway anyway the 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 idea that we look at we look at the wealth that we have or the, or the resources we have, say just by you know living in a place where at this point, you know up until recently at least jobs were plentiful, um, you could you could support yourself if you worked hard and you could maybe generate some excess by the time you you know reach middle age, um, and we see that as an opportunity. Our whole our whole mindset is about the kingdom of God and how we can advance that kingdom. When you have that mindset, you're not going to sit on $300,000 and spend 10,000 for the kingdom. That's not how people do with their passions. Um, and so, and so you may, you, you know, you may determine that your family, you know, needs an air conditioner for their well-being, but you're going to be raising a family who's constantly looking for opportunities to reach out to others and to and to bless the world and 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 there's there's um there's synergies and 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 like multiplier effects 
of having people who are passionate about something and who are affecting the people around them and creating ripple effects constantly from their lives because they have passion around something that go way beyond the, you know, the dollars and cents that you're spending right now on the groceries you bought this week. Um, and how much that leaves to send to, to India or whatever. Like, so, so that's kind of the other side of, of looking at this. You've got to start with the assumption, like the, the conversation is pointless if you don't have a heart for the kingdom of God. If, we're, if you're looking for, if you're trying to understand how much do I have to give away in order to please God, then, then you might as well just go spend it on yourself. Um, I mean, there's some missions that would be happy to have whatever your guilt causes you to give up, but, but that's, that's not going to do you any good. And it's certainly not going to ensure you a place in the kingdom of God, if that's your mindset. So, so once we have that heart, I think there's a certain degree to which we're going Mm -hmm. to find that sweet spot. And, and, and a lot of these Quest, hypothetical questions and questions of amounts and details and, and percentages become become a little less become maybe maybe fairly irrelevant because I think we've all seen very wealthy people and very poor people who live their lives for the kingdom of God. You see them pouring out all the resources they ha- that they they can possibly generate for for the causes they care about. If you're not doing that. Um, like it's good to spur spur each other on to get our priorities in the right place. Sometimes the way we're using our resources can be a symptom that might be helpful to our brothers in holding us accountable. But but ultimately, it's it's really about your passion. And if if you have the passion, then your treasure is going to you know your your wealth is going to go to the place where your heart is. I think, you know, it's it's kind of a restatement of what I've already said, but I, I really do think that that if if you're not bothered by what Jesus says about money, I don't think you're paying attention. And I th- and I think that that I I've had so many different thoughts about it's such a complex issue, right? Like on the one hand, I had an experience one time I was in Kenya and I was, I was at a brother in the churches, one of the churches, there's little shack, him and his wife and his baby lived in no electricity inside it, literally just a village shack. And we were sitting there and he was being as hospitable as he, he possibly could. He had his wife run up to the little market and bring us a soda and, and just having a very pleasant time in his dirt floor shanty. And he asked me looking around he said is your house in america like this and i was like no it's it's not anything like this nothing like this and that's a that's a that's a really discomforting conversation to have and and uh, and i think like that's one of those experiences that I can't shake when I read Jesus. Like if you're not mindful that that's the condition of the world, then I, I, Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm worried about you Mm -hmm. at the same time, you know, I come back and I'm, and I work and I live and I, I, I'm in America and I tried to synthesize my life with, with my experiences in the developing world and how we supposed to make sense of these things. And, you know, it's like, uh, where does that, where do those burdens lie in our life? And where does our re- responsibility and culpability lie? And, and to what extent, I know, you know, that world wealth meter, that website, I don't know if you've seen it before, but you put in your annual income and it shows you what percentage of the world's wealth you're in. And if you live in America, I can almost guarantee you, you're in the top percent of the world. Like we're, if you live, if you're an American, if you're a North American, you're the rich young ruler. We're the rich young ruler. And so what is, what's God calling on us to do about that? Uh, It certainly involves a rearticulation of our, of our relationship to things and to money. That has to be, that's, that's like acts to like, 
-hmm. when the Holy Ghost moves on people, it reorients their, their disposition to possession in the world it has to, but how is that being played out and what does it mean for us? And how, th then on the other hand, I, I talk to my brothers in Uganda and I try to explain life in America and what it's like. And, and I tell them, you know, that a gallon of milk is 11,000 shillings and they can't imagine for the life of them paying 11,000 shillings for a gallon of milk. Like mm -hmm. everything's bigger here. The money is worth more and the commodities cost more and all these things scale up. And the requirement of my society, like America is a level of wealth and opulence that the society and the government expects me to keep my children mm -hmm. within certain parameters. Yeah. They need to have clothing. They need to have a roof over their head. They need to have medical care. They need to things that aren't considerations in some parts of the developing mm -hmm. world. And so all those things are modifiers of how you, how you interact with this discussion. And, and I, I feel like it's, it's just one of the things that the journey is really the, the discovery and the, and, and the re-navigating the issues are really what God's after with his people. He just, it's not, it's one of the places where you're not supposed to come to conclusions on, where you're supposed to have a lifelong wrestling with the issue of, mm -hmm. of, of wealth and economy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, so. um, yeah, go ahead while I still keep formulating my thoughts. <laughs> hey, yeah, I was just going to say in, in summary, Matthew, what you're saying is, um, yeah, if you think, if you think, if you have an answer that makes you comfortable, you probably have the wrong answer. Right. Right. Um, yeah. And, and I think, I, I think that it, one of the reasons it's that way is because we are in a world that's really, really broken and we're enmeshed in systems that are broken right. and we can't actually extricate ourselves, you know, no matter what steps we take to, to try to be, to try to be less responsible for harm our economic system more than it's ever been is is um you know it's it's interconnected around the globe and we are participating in systems mm -hmm. that harm other people and and if we and if if we were going you know like you said if i were going to become radical about that to the point where i would say i am simply not going to use or purchase anything from anyone where that money would end up causing harm, um, the government would probably come and take my children away. Um, right. And, mm -hmm. and so, and so that's, you know, that's, that's where we are. We're, we're in these systems and, and, and we should, we should have, that should, that should constantly be goading our conscience on some level so that we're always, we always, Understanding that we have a sense of culpability, that we have, we part, we share the culpability in in the in the harm that's happening in the world, gives us a sense, helps us to, to maintain a sense of responsibility for for mitigating that harm, and and um, the other the other thing, just as a mental model that I don't think has really been brought up here, is that the backdrop, I, I think the clear backdrop. Um, the counter the, com the complete counter worldview that christians should have that eliminates kind of the concept of capitalism is that and that really is a heresy in our in our modern economic uh, you know western economic thinking is that ownership is not absolute ownership is not an individual birthright yeah. ownership is something according to the scriptures that's given to you as a stewardship and it's it that's not just a platitude to mouth in order to justify what i want to do with my wealth it gen it genuinely means that if i am not if i am not consciously and consistently putting god's priorities first with the way that i spend all of my all of my resources um that i'm just like the ups driver that just takes home some of the packages which i think is david Brousseau's analogy you know, you don't get to do that. It's not yours. And that is, that is a paradigm that is going to really reshape also how, how we view, view things. If we really internalize it and believe it, it'll, it'll change the way we use our resources because it's not, you haven't been given, I haven't been given the resources I have 
so that I can decide what, you know, so that I can decide what kinds of good to use it for. I've been given it so that I can use it for the priorities God has told me he has on his heart for the world. So when you, when you bash capitalism, I'm, I'm a little confused um, because in my simplistic mind, the al uh, only alternative is socialism. And that seems like coerced morality. Um, so what, what do you mean when you're speaking negatively about capitalism and what's the alternative as far as an economic system? Um, Dave, I think Dave had something to say on the, probably on the sure. previous thread before we go. Yeah. On. If, um, basically what you, what you were saying earlier, Matthew, about the, you know, the, the words of Christ should make you uncomfortable. Um, that I have a propensity always have for what my dad calls thinking yourself into a hole. Um, and, um, because of that, you know, I, I run into those things and it can really become a, this thing where I'm, where I, I'm circling and I'm trying to, trying to nail it down, trying to figure it out, trying to get it right. Um, you know, what's, what's the right way to see this? What's the right way? And I spent, um, a lot of time in some pretty toxic, um, I would even say spiritually abusive type situations where, um, I got these ideas about God, um, that if I like it, God doesn't want me to have it. If I, if I want, right. you just meet it, muted I, Dave. If I, um, if I want to do it, um, it must not be something that God wants me to do. If I enjoy it, it's something God wants me to give up. And, um, so, and, and I was kind of stuck in this thing for, for a number of years and finally kind of sorted through, kind of sorting through that. But I still, I look, I, I, I look at the teachings of Jesus and the things that he said to different people. Um, you know, he tells a rich young ruler to sell everything and yet. You know, Joseph of Arimathea has a tomb on hand that when Jesus dies that, you know, he can do it. Um, Zacchaeus gives half his stuff and the other, you know, whatever it took to pay off his, um, his ill-gotten things. So if we're talking about discomfort and in, in, in uncertainty about what Jesus actually, you know, what's, what's the whole picture? No, I don't have it figured out, but I don't think it's something that can be generalized because I see different people throughout even the Gospels um, coming out at different places with the call of Christ um, on them. And well, go ahead. Well, I, I, just an answer to that, and I'd like to hear what, I, what your other thought is. Mm -hmm. I don't what I don't mean is that we can't please God. I mean that that certain things are supposed to be perpetually disturbing. Like my relationship with yeah. anger and violence in the systems of this world is always something that needs to be modified. It's like trimming sails. You have to stay on course with those things. Um, mm -hmm. You know, pe the way yeah. we lust with power and with money are all things that require constant and continual maintenance. I think we can live in victory and all those things, but it, it it's not something that you get to put to bed and say, Oh, I figured that out. Right. Right. And that's, that's, I was hearing that. So, um, and then the other thing is I've, I've read, um, and we're not going to name any names. We've referred to some of these people as he that must not be named, but it's not the one you're thinking of. It's the other one. Um, and we um, have far too many. Very, <laughs> exactly the original he that must not be named um uh -huh. I, i'm with and you i i remember reading some things um specifically and some of you are going to start googling to figure out what it is anyway but um the story about your grandpa just died and you inherited this massive collection of cuckoo clocks um is the one illustration that's given and that these are these are dead things that are going to weigh down your soul, and it's wrong to have them. It's wrong to possess them. They could be sold, and they could be, you know, for all this money. And I understand that. I kind of understand the point of it, and I think that maybe that's what some people need to do. My issue with that, and my issue with a lot of this um, 
anti-material stuff, which strikes me as borderline Gnostic, is that there's nothing you can actually do about it. Right. So just to, to give you an analogy, let's suppose your grandpa died and left you a massive porn collection, including first editions of this, that, and the other. Um, it wouldn't be okay to put that stuff on eBay because nobody should have it. Uh, right. The thing to do is what they did in the book of Acts and have a big fire, even though it's 70,000 pieces of silver that it's worth or whatever. Um, and so my point is, if this luxury or if this thing that your grandpa left you, this collector's item, is wrong for you to have, it's wrong for anybody to have, and for you to sell it is just putting that sin on somebody else. And the fact that you're using that money that they should have already given to God, didn't give any to God, is, um, I mean, that's only taking taking you off the hook. You may as well have had a bonfire, right? Um, well, I, there's, there's a little bit of a problem with that logic, but I follow no, your that, point. That's my, that's my issue with, um, with some of these type of things is you can't generalize them because it doesn't work. It breaks. Even the story of the rich man, the, ri the rich young ruler, um, if everybody took the rich young ruler and said that's that's for us personally and had a fire sale, the price of land and every and all other commodities would drop through the floor because it's we've got nothing but sellers, um, and that and then that, the poor could afford it. Pardon me. Then, then the, the poor, poor would could be afford, able it. To afford it. Fair enough. <laughs> hey, so one other thing that's interesting too is that so the problem in your logic, Dave, is that if you have 50 clocks or 50 cars or 50 whatever that you can't use to sell them to people who ha who would have one who can use it, it it doesn't doesn't create the same kind of, of burden and the other thing is that i think that that we generally accept that there's a different moral code required for the church than the world like the disciples of jesus have obligations that other people don't so that's a part of the conditioning. You know, one other thing I'd mentioned too in this discourse about people in the New Testament and where they lie, it's obvious that Jesus is after, after our whole self, not just mm -hmm. dollars. Like, what is, what's Jesus care about dollars? That's not a significant thing to him. What, how people are re relating to dollars is what he cares about. And if you, if you look at, I, I was surprised to think through this thought experiment with Zacchaeus, for instance, because, because it's notable because the, Zacchaeus is the opposite of the rich young ruler. The rich young ruler says, no, I don't want to do that. And Zacchaeus is like, hey, I'm, I'm going to do whatever it takes. But just think about this. Now, I know a little bit about, about tax farmers in, in Palestine in the first century, and they were they were brutal people like you you had to buy you you bid for a tax contract to be able to ta collect taxes for for the empire in a certain area and and so Zacchaeus was a shrewd and a dangerous person to be able to be a traitor against his whole community and work for Rome he was going to get paid and the treachery with which those men did that work was horrifying so let's just be super radically conservative and say that only 20% of Zacchaeus's income was ill-gotten gains. If you pay that back four times, that's 80% of his personal wealth. And then he's going to give half of what he, give, what he has to the poor. That's 90% of his personal wealth. That leaves Zacchaeus living on 10. That's, that's, and, and that kind of, I think what's, it's not that, it's not that Jesus wants 90%. It's what he recognizes in Zacchaeus is an absolute abandon. Like, mm -hmm. this doesn't matter to me anymore. What matters to me is you. What matters to me is being right with God. And I think if that's the place that we can get to, that's what's also happening in Acts. Like, no man mm -hmm. considered anything he possessed as his own. Like, it's not mine. I, I, I'm re- I'm repositioning. I'm going to I'm going to redefine myself in terms of possession. So full circle. Now if we talk about capitalism, this is the real problem with capitalism is that capitalism runs the opposite way and that's why capitalism as a system is essentially anti-Christian. Now when I say that, I'm not I'm not negligent of of the amount of wealth that capitalism has created in the world and and that 
it's fair to say that it's increased the standard of living even among the world's poor because of capitalist systems. But that's not a that's not an accurate analysis. First of all, the 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 fuel of the system is greed, bottom lining mm -hmm. everything in terms of capital and and consumption, makes greed the fuel that makes the system run, and that's anti-Christian. And, and can I just put in here? I have heard a group of Hutterites sit around a living room and say that greed is good on the national level because of that. <laughs> I'm sure you have. <laughs> is is greed essential to capitalism? I missed you, Dave. You're cutting out. He said, he said is, is greed, greed essential. essential to capitalism? Is greed? Yeah. Well, and, and yeah. these these bazillionaires, um, they don't. They're not getting more money because they need it. They're getting more money because that's how they keep score. Right. But right. what would the world be if we're all trying to produce? And obviously, part of the reason I go to work, I don't go to work because, you know, it's fun and I do it for grins and giggles. I go to work because then there's, you know, there's something in it for me. And that's how everybody operates. Um, right. And but but if the world was operating as a way of I'm trying to meet my needs by meeting your needs, you're trying to meet your needs by meeting the other guy's needs and so forth. And it wasn't we're going to see how big of a pile would that just not be capitalism then? Well, let, let's let's back up for a minute first. Like here, okay. here's here's the conversation. I just actually recently had a conversation with somebody this week about capitalism and, and its potential values and demerits. What I was what I was trying the point I was trying to make is that one of my main um, targets in the conversation is to renegotiate Christians' thought process in regards to economic systems. Like we have a narrative that capitalism equals good and Marxism equals bad, and and there's certain reasons why we think that way, but most of those things are cultural, not intellectual or moral. For instance, if you if you happen to if you happen to observe early industrial capitalists, Marx makes a lot more sense. I mean, you know mm -hmm. who popularizes Marx is Dickens. Like uh -huh. that world, that industrial world that's preying on children and the weak and mm -hmm. the poor, that's early capitalism. And that's if you are living in that world, you might want to invent some different ways of thinking about about economic principles too. Now, I'm not I'm not pro Marxist because it utilizes power and violence in order to get its mm -hmm. aims, and that's not Christian either. But you can't create a construct where capitalism is a good Christian American value and Marxism is a godless atheist horror. They're both like it's like somebody telling me that the GOP is great and the Democrats are bad, or vice versa. I'm not none of the above like there's a different way of thinking so so my what i advocate is christian communalism i'm a communalist not a communist a mm -hmm. communalist and i think that's what the bible teaches i think that's how we should be looking at we should be trying to create equality we should be trying to use our resources to alleviate suffering in the world and we should be trying to pull everybody up and especially in the household mm -hmm. of faith we should be creating systems of equality that's mm -hmm. that's what I think God's desire is. And, and, and the earlier precedent for that is the socialized private property systems with socialized welfare programs in among the Hebrews when God was making the economic laws for the civil structure. So so these there's precedent in the Old Testament structures and there's specific commands and injunctions in the New Testament that tell us as God's people how, what our economic model should look like within certain parameters if mm -hmm. outside of the church and how we're operating as god's people i can i can live that way in a marxist economy i can live that way in a capitalist economy my mm -hmm. pushback against american capitalists has been nobody in our side of the of nobody on our side of the economic political structure is taking an accurate analysis of the cost of capitalism like we right. there's like Okay, we talk about the horrors of the Box Rebellion, the Cultural Revolution, the gulags, and all that. That's that's horrible. 
But what about the millions of people that we've killed for capitalistic empire? I mean, all across mm-hmm. the Middle East since the Cold War, since before the Cold War, all across mm-hmm. South America, all across Southeast Asia. Like there are millions of victims with that that capitalism has the blood of millions of victims on its hands, mm-hmm. and and you mm-hmm. don't spend a dollar like. There's no, there's none of these that don't have blood on them. Every one of them does. You, you can't be clean with this stuff. Like it's mm-hmm. a, it's a currency of power in the world. It just isn't clean. So how do we, as God's people, operate within those confines? Well, it's like the other things. It's like the police that run the systems of the world around us, or the militaries mm-hmm. or the governments or all those things. It's one of those kinds of things. But if I start to align myself ideologically and in the power mm-hmm. structure with capitalist aims, I've missed the heartbeat of God. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and I, I think it's important to, to, to recognize as well that, that one of the reasons, one of the only reasons I think that we can get away with doing this Um, like that it can feel like capitalism is harmless is because we, the genius of the local, of the global economy. um, We outsource our victimization. Yeah. In Charles Dickens day, those children were working those looms, you know, for 16 hours a day, right next door to you. You knew they were there. They were Um, your children. You knew. Right. Yeah everybody or they were your or they were your neighbor's children and you were making the money off of them it was it was very very immediate and and today i feel like in the west there has been an advance in in social consciousness there's the conscience of people has been awakened to how wrong those things were thanks to people like dickens right and many other people who 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 use christian arguments to to point out how wrong this kind of behavior was but the 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 magic of the system is that it's continued as 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 people's consciences became uncomfortable more and more uncomfortable with that kind of exploitation we came up with a system that would allow us to remove it to arm's length where we didn't have to see it where it's behind a, a wall or an ocean and we can and we can tell ourselves if we want to all we have to do to not see it is to switch off the knob and and so, and that makes it really easy to choose ignorance if you want to, and to buy into a narrative if it's in, if it feels like it's in my interest that says this way of life, you know, this way of using money just makes a wonderful utopia for everybody. And we just need to do it more and nothing needs fixed. Well, it's, it's the genius of, of American empire to outsource both its political and its economic violence. And what I mean by that is that, you know, instead of fighting a war with Russia or China, we've outsourced that war to Afghanistan, Iraq, South America, Southeast Asia. Mm -hmm. So we fought those wars with other human casualty Mm -hmm. instead of our own. So we don't have to Mm -hmm. see it. It's not on our shores. And we've done the same exact thing with our economic system. Mm -hmm. We've outsourced the, the, the children in the factories to a place where we can't see them which exactly like you said, Anthony, allows us to pretend like it's not there and we're just doing all good in the world. Mm-hmm. Sometime, and, and this is a so, much longer discussion than we'll be able to get into tonight, but I would love to talk about how to avoid supporting slavery in sweatshops in Asia, for example. Um, I, I think Finney's kind of into that and maybe you're into it a bit too, Matthew. I, to me, it's just so overwhelming. I don't even know how to start. I, yeah. I need to just do a little bit of research and just at least start in a few small ways because doing a little bit is better than nothing. I guess to me, it, it helps looks to be like, wealthy. <laughs> yeah, that, that's the problem. I, I think to me, it's it's kind of like, yeah, if, uh, either, I, I guess I, I might have this false dichotomy in my mind where either I do nothing to support slavery or I, um, right. well, as in I, I don't participate in buying any of that stuff or mm-hmm. um, I just, you know, give up which is kind of what i have been Mm -hmm. doing (laughs) so Uh, i don't know if if you if anyone has any practical pointers yeah yeah, i can give you a five minute answer that i can give you a two minute answer that you're right i i've 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 experimented with trying to shun all all, all, anything that could be tainted 
So only buying clothes from the Goodwill because they're secondhand, you know, really emphasizing secondhand usage, which I think is a great resolution to that. Buying secondhand displaces that a, a good deal. It doesn't it doesn't make it not happen, but you're not participating in in continuing the system that's causing that. The other how, how so though? I mean, sorry, but I mean, you're, well, because that, it's that already still been produced. done and purchased. So it's like, like it's the, like the, using the, a vaccination with aborted baby cells because it's already well, what, been done. <laughs> you're but you're not you're not feeding the system that created it in the first place. I, I get it. It's 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 removed. It's one right. step removed. Yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't doesn't and it doesn't but the commodity exists. Yeah, it doesn't right. incentivize the the, right. the the secondhand clothing industry is actually I just read a long article about this recently, like it's actually really suffering. And it's and it's an industry that produces a lot of wealth for poor people in third world countries, right? Um, and and so and so when yeah when you keep that industry running, you're actually probably working in the right direction. It's a complicated issue because um, because you know like if you look at the urbanization of China, for instance, um, like those people by and large aren't being forced to move into urban manufacturing but they're choosing to because a, a lot of people are 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 weighing their options and and realizing it. we see it in uganda as well like the urbanization of the developing world it, it essentially amounts to the idea that people living in remote agricultural subsistence situations are wagering that they have more opportunity in an urban potentially manufacturing environment and that's a mm -hmm. that's maybe a developmental phase of of developing economies. I don't know. I'm not. I'm, it's out of my league. But it is happening. And so, what what you have to face is that a, a a poor Chinese worker is leaving his farm with his parents and moving into Shenzhen to work in a factory. Maybe some of them are being deceived, but a lot of them are making that choice. I I, th mm -hmm. I think that what one of the correctives that I would love to see American Christians making is revaluing commodities. And we, we, mm -hmm. we practice this from, I, I, I ebb and flow with it, but it's a virtue that I, that I, that I believe is important. And I try to bring up again, think about your commodities in the terms of their real value, not in terms of their market value. Like, I'm amazed at the power of, of our market economy in this way. We can, we can harvest resources anywhere in the world, say even in America, like with lumber and stuff. We can ship those raw materials across the ocean to China, run them through manufacturing, redistribution, and then reship them back across America and they'll and go through our own distribution networks and end up in retail space where you can buy something at a dollar store. Like that's mm -hmm. astounding. That's like, I don't know how it's possible, but it is. But the problem is that that dollar price tag or the $5 for a shirt at Walmart or for six pairs of socks, somebody's paying the real cost of those goods. Mm -hmm. It's just not you at the register. So reorienting value is a something that I, I think especially poor Christians, because I was caught in this trap for a long time. Until we started studying labor and slave labor, it wasn't something I thought about much. I was just, I was on the lower economic scale in America and I knew I needed to make my dollars stretch as far as I could and I had a lot of children to feed. And so we just always went for the cheapest deal. And, and but it's, it takes some, some thought and to think about what would it take me to make my own pair of socks? Like what would it cost my wife in time and resource to make my socks. Well, that's probably a lot closer to the value of a pair of socks. So we're better off looking to pay for real value instead of market values. You're better off owning three pairs of socks that are made by a Peruvian woman out of wool. I have one pair of nice wool socks that you keep for the winter that you paid 20 or 30 bucks for, but you just have one. And they work well, and that's and you paid somebody to actually make them. Where we can do that, I think the better off we are, the less culpable mm -hmm. we are for the systems that are taking advantage of people. And and I just like to add to that that 
once again, that's an anti-capitalist calculation. The capitalism as a, as a philosophy says that if it's in the store for a dollar and that's like, if the market rewarded is rewarding someone for right. selling you a pair of socks for a dollar or whatever, then that's a good thing. Like you don't right. have to ask any more questions about right. that. If somebody is mad about the job they have somewhere, then they're going to throw a fit and it's going to become more expensive to make it there than to pay them. You know, it's going to be, it's going to begin to pay people to give people better working environments and then it'll automatically all fix itself. And that is simply not true. And you have to, you know, you have to be willing to question that narrative in order to even think you have a responsibility to start asking those kinds of questions. To, to simply so, say, well, I'm <clears throat> not going to, I'm not going to follow the market with my money and just go to wherever, you know, let my money flow downhill to the lowest common denominator to whatever costs me the least. So what I'm hearing is that one of the big issues with capitalism is the lie that people actually have a choice. That if it was really a matter of, hey, if you don't like your job, go do something else and whatever and let the market fix it. But the thing is, because of the way like they can just look at people and say well fine then if you're not willing to make pencils for you know an eighth of a cent each you can just go starve we'll find somebody else right um and and, and that, that it's um intrinsically predatory and um we just don't see the predatoriness up close because it's happening elsewhere a am i hearing you right is that is that one of the one of the big lies of capitalism yeah. Yeah. We're, we, we've displaced the real value of our commodities on, onto a subjugated people, whether they're economically subjugated or, or literally subjugated, which happens, you know, in Thai clothing or in Philippines clothing factories, whatever the case may be. So another question I had, um, you were talking about communalism earlier. So is, and, and I realize Christianity is a subculture. It's never, it's not like the world ever, you know, gets away from these broken systems we're talking about. We are the salt and the light that, um, that, and um, my, my favorite illustration being the leaven that um, gradually leavens the world around us to be more kingdom like, even if, you know, the, even, even in a world that's not submitted to Christ. Mm -hmm. um, but where, where is the room then in, um, in a, a communal type of situation with the redistribution and so on for difference in personality. We're probably all familiar with the story about the, the businessman that was down in Mexico and he's talking to one of these fellows in the village who's got a line out in the water. And he says, well, you know, why don't you go and um, why don't you go and, and put four lines in the water and then you can catch four times as many fish. And the guy says, why well, wouldn't we do that? Well, he said, well, then you can buy a boat and eventually you can hire some people and so forth. And, um, and he keeps asking, why do I want to do that? Why do I want to do that? And finally, the fellow says, well, because then you can retire and you have a lot of money and you can sit on the beach and fish all day. And the fellow says, well, that's what I'm doing already. Um, so here we have a guy that's, you know, he likes to catch a few fish and then he wants to sit with his friends and his family there in the village and play his ukulele or whatever. And he's having a good time. Well, over here, Maybe in the same town, there's a fellow that's really, really driven and he really enjoys being an entrepreneur and so forth. So how in a, in a communal system does that work? Because it seems unfair for those two people to be rewarded at the same level of standard of living and so on. Um, how, what, what, do you, what do you do with that or what do you say to that? Well, there's a, there is a Christian work ethic right i mean the, the the curse is to to eat by the sweat of your brow so everybody everybody in the church has to be working to pull their own weight that's that's right. a bottom line basic christian value but but when it comes to the disparities i think what the point um the main point is that the main point of equality anyhow is that we should never within any given christian community and and maybe within the world we shouldn't have a brother in one home who doesn't know how he's going to feed his children and a brother in another home who has more than he needs. Like that discrepancy is wrong and, right. and ought to be the aim of the Christian church to, to destroy that discrepancy. 
That doesn't so, mean that everyone has to have the same amount of clothes or the same shoes, or the same everything else, uh, okay. but there ought to be an equality of need. So here's a fellow just to put just a, as a, for example, or whatever. So here's a fellow that looks and says, Hey, you know, I've got a, I've got a family and I figured a way that I can support those, that my family, um, in 30, 35 hours a week or whatever. And then I want to spend the rest of the time with them. And here's a fellow over here. Maybe he's single. Maybe he has a family um, that, that works with him, but he just, he, like, he just loves his work and he wants to work 60 hours a week. So there's room for, there's room for that range within the community. The issue is more, here's a fellow that's working 60 hours a week and he's still not able to make ends meet. And here's a fellow over here that has a bunch of investments and he doesn't have to work at all, and he's got he's got surplus. Well, this fellow over here can is is almost starving. That that's what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, and 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 that and that again that presupposes that your wealth is not an absolute birthright. Like if if whatever you can earn is yours, and then you are absolutely sovereign over that, then there's no way you can say it's morally wrong for you not to share it to the guy with the guy that wasn't fortunate enough to earn as much. Um, right. By saying, by saying what Matthew was just saying, or the way you rephrased it, you're, you're saying that this wealth is given to us conditionally, and that we mm -hmm. only have a right to it. It's only like our right to it only extends as far as we're using it to, according to God's purposes. And when we stop doing that, we become illegitimate possessors, and mm -hmm. that's and that's a that's a challenging concept for someone who's been, um, you know, trained in that in that very modern, recent Western mindset of of ownership as, as some sort of birthright. That's not a Christian moral value. I don't think we can say that loudly enough. That it's concept Roman. that you, you, yeah, that idea that that idea that ownership is absolute is not that's an anti-Christian belief. That's a, that's a pagan idea and Jesus did not teach it, the apostles did not teach it, the church did not teach it for something like 1500 years. The Hebrews um, didn't teach it. The pagans didn't teach it for 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 quite a bit of time BC. Um and and like most humans of goodwill who have actually thought about morals have not seen what have not seen ownership as something that should be absolute. It's right. something that is conditional on whether you're using your res. It's it's more of a, it's more of a um. A, a community trust that we allow a person, the community, the community, and in Christian community, it should be the same way. We we bless a person to 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 generate wealth and to work hard and, and create all kinds of great things in the world, as long as they aren't doing harm in the process of, of creating mm -hmm. that. And as long as they are using those resources in a way that's not harmful for the community and that isn't right. harmfully withholding resources where they're needed. Once, mm -hmm. once you are not making a good faith effort to use those resources to bless the world around you for the good of your fellow humans, then at that point, and I mean all of those resources, not just the ones you feel like you can conveniently dispense with after you've spent it on your, you know, whatever luxuries you want. It is, if I'm not using my resources to, the, to maximize the good that I produce for the world, then to whatever degree I'm not doing that, I am, I'm stealing. And that is explicitly what the early Christians taught. And, and I think we can, we can say that much without having to go into details um, because every person has a conscience. Like we know, we, we know we probably every one of us can think of some things that I am doing that are probably frivolous with some of my resources right. and where we can clean up our act. Right. Well, so I need to, I need to go to bed soon so I can get up and make money. But at some point here, um, we should answer a question from Paul Zook. He was wondering if there's any, charities that we can recommend that would directly go to fighting starvation um do you guys have any recommendations uh 
Um, if if the goal specifically is is food relief, there are several places. Um, I, I worked in in a refugee camp in Kirindongo, Uganda, with South Sudanese refugees, and um, the World Food Program, run by the UN, actually does a, an enormous amount of food procurement and distribution among refugees. It's a huge, huge task that, that they've taken on. Um, it's obviously completely secular. There's smaller programs. Um, there's one called Feed the Hungry that does lunches in schools uh, in refugee settlements in Uganda. Um, Feed the Children, it's called. Uh, again, it's not, it's not an organization I'm linked to in any way, spiritually or, or, or in any way. I just know they're feeding children. Um, there's an, there, uh, there's a work that, that we're doing in Uganda right now. Um, it's called his image ministries. It's not food relief, but it is abortion mitigation and abortion is illegal in Uganda, but it's very common, especially among the student population. Our communities are settled right in Makarere university. And we do a lot of education uh, resource uh, uh, research among the student population about attitudes towards abortion. And we hear from women um, that, are, that are at risk of, of having an abortion uh, and we counsel with them regardless of the decisions they make. And we try to recommend that they pursue life and help them find solutions. There's a lot of pressure on women, especially in education. children and um and so we work with them get them through a pregnancy help them find long-term sustained work and employment it's been a fantastic small-scale charity that we do um and you can find that on father's way website it's uh, his image ministries in kampala you guys have any other recommendations so there's an organization called open hands that my brother's been working for for a while, he was stationed in Kenya, and then he moved to Detroit. Um, they they work uh, with you know low income countries um, by creating savings groups, um, so trying to provide long term solutions to poverty. Um, and yeah, so I would recommend people go there. Dave uh, or. Anthony, do you either you have a? I don't. I don't have any. Um, yeah, any that I that that spring to mind. Cam was my go-to go for a long time. Yeah, that was me. Cam was my go-to. Right. Are they completely canceled? Was. Now? They are canceled. All right. I'd love to uncancel them, but you're gonna have to do something better than. Uh, we feel bad for the kids that uh, had the misfortune of experiencing immorality at a young age. Because unless the system that created that has changed, the uh, yeah, the the things that happen. Wait, that will was that again. was the exact words. The un- that was as close as I could get to the exact words. Yes. Well, it was too bad that Jariah Mass had the experience of being sent back down. That's what I'm really upset about, and that we all had the experience of having to watch it happen um so that was unfortunate too um i do have i have another question matthew and uh well anybody but on the issue of and i know that it's the favorite reason why we don't help poor people and i think there was even a meme about it recently we can't help them jesus because that'll ruin the incentive for them to better themselves right but uh the way i heard it said was we don't want to take him off the cross Oh no. Now what? The way I used to hear it was we don't want to take a brother off the cross. Really? Wow. No, that, that's kind of messed up. But but there but there is a legitimate like so here's somebody, whoever, that doesn't have a lot of skills. Like all he knows how to do is dig ditches. And so he's having a hard time making ends meet. And for you to go to him and say, Look, you could learn these skills and be able to be a plumber or an electrician or whatever. And we can help you and you you'd be able to provide more 
like where is the right place for that um without having also all the issues of of the like you said the inequality and all those kind of things because the world is objectively a better place when there's pressure for people to better themselves um that's why i have a number of of things that i'm involved in and skills that i've learned and it's it was always because um i didn't have enough money and so i'm like well i'm gonna learn how to do this and now this is the way i'm gonna be able to help other people with different things so where's is there is there a way to balance that or is that just well people just need to behave themselves and better themselves when the opportunity arrives um I, i'd like to hear your thoughts on that i'll, I'll jump out uh, on that I, I there's a couple of thoughts that i have in regards to the whole issue uh, at large one is that there's a difference between people i know that i have some kind of pastoral responsibility for and i don't mean as their pastor i just mean as a as a christian brother who cares for their life uh -huh. um that's one thing somebody that i have some kind of relationship or especially accountability within the church with those conversations look quite different because there's more than just an interpersonal thing going on there's the church's ministry into somebody's life and so you know to take somebody who's maybe slothful or unwise with their money and to give them some training and education and, and admonition within the context of the church makes all the sense in the world. It makes their world better. It makes their family better. It makes the world better. Mm -hmm. But I, what I don't like is trying to leverage those things outside of relationships. So what I mean by that is that I often hear, um, I often hear that that we shouldn't give money to people like homeless people because they may be or maybe they or maybe they will spend it on alcohol or drugs or whatever the case may be or they're they're making bad decisions in their life and that's why they're they're panhandling and I, I, I don't buy any of that. Um, it's not that it's not true it's it's just not the right priority schema. What I think is the case is that, um, there's all kinds of poverty. There's, there's moral poverty, there's intellectual poverty, there's physical resource poverty, there's spiritual poverty. There's a lot of poverty. And I think what, what it does, it's a very, it's a very cheap way to experience God, to just respond affirmatively to someone who asks you to meet a need. Like, one of the things I, I, I think of um, is that it is a it is a an objective good to feed the poor. I don't care if they're moral or immoral. I don't care if they're going to change their life. I don't care if they're ever going to become a Christian. To put food in somebody's mouth is always an objective good because he's the image of God. And to care for the poor is to care for God's creation. And that objective good exonerates any potential problems from you know meeting a homeless guy on the street and giving him a few bucks because you have it in your pocket i don't ever worry about that and i don't think anybody ever should if you have it give it and i and even if they do go buy a beer or whatever the case may be there's something that it does to god's people to be obedient to jesus to say give to him that asks mm -hmm. you like, I'm not going to, I'm not going to weigh that. I'm not going to have to figure it out. I'm not, you know, I'm just going to give it. Now, where I'll say that's a little more complex is in the developing world. Like when you have, when you have children being abused so that they look scrawny and miserable and then trying to hit up white people for money, that's a much more complicated scenario. But most of us are not dealing right. with those kinds of scenarios. So in general terms, mm -hmm. when you're dealing with the poor, just just give them what they're asked. If you have it, give it. That's that's an objective Christian good. Okay. I was so, in this conversation once so if I when could, someone tried. Go ahead, Dave. Go ahead. Um, I, I, I want to hear it, and then was, I'll try to restate what I'm hearing. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> See, I was in this conversation once in a brother's meeting where someone triumphantly pulled out and brandished a – they were prepared for this conversation um, – <laughs> they brandished an envelope from a televangelist asking for money and said, well, uh, Jesus says you should give to him who asks. Now, what are you going to do about this? And so, yeah, th I think it's clear that excessive literalism is not what's being advocated mm -hmm. here. Right. The idea is that 
that there are people who are genuinely in need um, who mm -hmm. ask, and we can always find an excuse not to obey that. Um, mm -hmm. And and um, if if we if we're looking for one, you know what the best barometer of this is. This is the thing when you meet somebody asking you for money, and he, here's the problem with li living in extremely rural environments, you'll never meet that person. But whenever you're, uh, whenever you're in, in, encountered by a homeless person or somebody panhandling or asking for money, here's how I can tell you if your heart's right or not. Can you look that person in the eyes? Because the, the Proverbs talks about hiding your eyes from the poor. And when we're at the right place, we can look people in the eyes. And when you have this attitude that you're trying to look away, you don't want to see them, mm -hmm. you want to hurry up and yeah. go along your way, you don't want to be bothered, that's a, that, should be, that should be your number one warning sign that you did it wrong. What you should always mm -hmm. be able to do is look people in the eyes. You should always be able to see the poor eye to eye. That's why, that's why it's the mark in Hebrews. I mean, in Proverbs. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So that's good. So what I'm hearing you say then, um, Matthew, especially in, in uh, by extension, Anthony, is that uh, going back to my question about um, bettering yourself, is that so? Here's a dude on a street that needs something. Um, it's not like you're going to look at him and say, "Now, what you really need to be doing with your life is right. it's he's hungry. You can buy him a sandwich or whatever." Right. And that's meeting the need. But if you're in that Christian community that you were talking about, and there's there's the discrepancy, you have a very prosperous business. Here's somebody that's maybe young married or, or maybe just as, you know, as a poor manager. And we know that poor managers shall not inherit the kingdom. That's in there somewhere. Um, but um, he's he's struggling to, to, you know, maybe making some financially uh, poor decisions or whatever, or, or maybe he just hasn't developed any skills. So he's like, well, all I know how to do is flip burgers. And then you can come to him and say, look, we keep running into this issue. Um, what are you interested in? But that, but that's part of that, that ongoing relationship. We're, we're yeah. wanting to help you. Right. But um, we also want you to be able to help yourself. Right. Mm -hmm. So, but, but, but it's um, so it's not just like we can set up this system where we have a community and we have the high earners and the low earners and we figure out some way of distributing, but it's like this, just like everything else in this conversation, there's this continual tension. There's this continual figuring out what do we need to do with this? What do we need to make happen? Am I, am I, am, am I hearing the, the thrust of what you're saying? Yeah. Okay. That's right. Mm -hmm. Because real, real help. And I, I'm not naive. Like we're not, we're not fixing poverty by giving a panhandler a few bucks that happens to be in our wallet or our pocket, but we are, we are, we are meeting immediate needs like relief and development are two different mm -hmm. things. And the Christian church, the Christian community should be good at development. We should be investing in people's lives and, and changing outcomes, but that requires a whole host of resources, not just financial that requires, you know, accountability and character development and relationships mm -hmm. and care and compassion and all those things so the yeah. issue is not how much resources or what the resources are but how are you reusing the resources to make the world a better place right mm -hmm. absolutely i kind of agree with you matthew I'm, i don't think there's anything wrong with giving money to panhandlers but um so we used to do a fair amount of street evangelism and I got to know homeless people. And I, I, it, there, a lot of times it is addictions and mental health problems that right. are the issue. And so I, I have respect for people who give money to homeless people and especially uh, more so get, you know, buy them a meal. I think that right. would be a better, a better idea, but I have yeah. more respect for people who, um, either start or get involved in social problems that address addictions and mental health problems. Um, so I, for a while I volunteered at our, our soup kitchen, um, which is more than that. It's called the Haven in Charlottesville and, and they do counseling and all that kind of stuff. And I, I didn't really get too involved. I, I just did it for a little bit. Um, but I, I really respect organizations like that that are doing that work 
And I think that where we can, even if it's a secular organization, like the one I worked at a little bit was secular. Um, I think that that's going to be way more beneficial um, to people on the streets. And I think you probably agree with that. We're back to bettering ourselves. Mental health issues with five bucks in his pocket is better off than a person with mental health issues with no money in his pocket. Sure, but what what could you have done with that five? Could you have given that to the local um, social program that is giving you know mental health counseling to homeless people, and would that have done more? Um, Maybe, that... but but I probably am not going to. What what, what I mean by well, that's that your is your problem. <laughs> what I mean by that is that we usually give that kind of we usually make those kinds of contributions on purpose. They're not extemporaneous, but when you meet somebody walking down the street who looks disheveled and looks like he hasn't had a meal for a while or looks like he's cold, that's not, I'm not going to walk by him and, and go write a check for $5 to the local soup kitchen. Right. That's an impulse spend. Right. And I do and, plenty of yeah, consumerist and, impulse spending. It'd be good to do some impulse charity. Yeah. And, and it's, and it's, it's also true that you don't know just as you don't know if the person's going to go spend that money on drugs, you don't know if the fact that you gave them that money, even if they do spend it on drugs, maybe it's a woman who doesn't sell her body that night um, yeah. because she can buy the drugs with the money you gave her. Right. It's too complicated of an analysis to do on the fly. Yeah. yeah. Better just to go with give to him that asks you. And it's a, it's a good, um, that's a good habit. I remember, I remember the time you talk about the, the the words of Jesus cutting. I remember the time when um, I realized I didn't agree with Jesus, <laughs> and that's that's never a good place to be. Um, but it was with the story when the fella comes to him and he says, "Make my brother split the inheritance fair." And Jesus said, "Well, first of all, you know." nobody who put me in charge to decide who gets what and secondly beware of covetousness because a man's life doesn't consist in the amount of stuff he has and there was something inside that said well jesus it actually kind of does (laughs) yeah (laughs) and and just coming to an awareness that that's that that's how I felt and, and um, was, was part of a, of, of a reprogramming process that number one, it, it really isn't about the stuff you have and you could do with a lot less stuff than the stuff you think you need. And no matter how much stuff you have, once you're looking for stuff, you never have enough of it. Um, so it's just becomes frustrating and exhausting after a while. Um, and so that kind of helped me to, um to well to realize that you don't even have to have a lot to still struggle with materialism um and also to to take you know his words and his attitude is an attitude of holding stuff with loose hands being willing to give and and that's why i like the thing if somebody asks you it says give to him now so it doesn't say give what they asked for but it says to give to them. And so to just have that, if you have it to give, to give it, um, and, and then that's your attitude, it really does help where it doesn't feel like the stuff has the hold on you right. that it used to. I, I, had, I once had an a evangelical friend of mine tell me that the studies show that Christians give less to uh, you know, people holding signs. And the reason is because Christians know that they've been forgiven by God, so they don't feel like they need to do good works. But oh, people God. who are not Christians don't know that, and so they're trying to do good works to make their uh, guilt less. <laughs> Wait, who was making All this point? Uh, this an a, evangelical, a yes, an evangelical friend of mine. <laughs> yeah, somebody Lord needs to mercy on with that guy la- with that guy with his cup laughing off that story because that's yes. that's that's yes. a wow. Well, I, I, I wasn't disappointed. I'm, I'm glad for all the input you brothers had. I, I want to close this out with one recommendation. This is one of my top five books that ever that I read. Uh, I recommend it all the time. Faith and Wealth by Justo Gonzalez. 
uh, History of the Early Christian Ideas of the Origin, Significance, and Use of Money. It's a fantastic book. You should definitely read it. Um, it's one of the best on the subject. So if you get a chance, read Faith and Wealth. Anybody else have anything they want to close with? Yeah, well, uh, maybe I'll, I'll go ahead, D Dave. Well, like I said at the beginning, I said I think we're probably going to come out real close to the same place. Um, uh, so I don't know if you guys ate my lunch or not, as was <laughs> as was promised, or if it's like Mark Twain said that the rumors of my lunch being eaten were vastly over <laughs> over exaggerated. <laughs> but anyway, I really really enjoyed it. I have a lot of I have a lot of uh, of good stuff to put in the grist mill to think about over the next couple of days. Well, I'll read a short quote from Clement of Alexandria, who is the rich man who will be saved, um, which I just like because it's kind of a bombshell in our mindset and and like messes with so many of our paradigms. Um, he says, Oh, excellent trading, oh, divine merchandise. One purchases immortality for money. And by giving the perishing things of the world, receives in exchange for these an eternal mansion in the heavens. Sail to this mart if you are wise, O rich man. If need be, sail round the whole world. Spare not perils and toils that you may purchase here the heavenly kingdom. Why do transparent stones and emeralds delight thee so much in a house that is fuel for fire, or a plaything of time, or the sport of an earthquake, or, the occasion, or an occasion for a tyrant's outrage? Aspire to dwell in the heavens and to reign with God. This kingdom, a man imitating God, will give thee by receiving a little here. There, through all ages, he will make thee a dweller with him. So, he says in there too. Life with money. Yeah, right. Amen. Uh, if you're listening, Amen. remember the poor and we'll. Uh, yep. And if you're like yeah. Titus and you don't like money, I got student loans. So, um you'll be happy you to like the load he's That's asking right. guys I'm, I'm, you have to give tim the ask yeah, exactly uh, i'll drop a paypal link in the comments there <laughs> please do hit him up all right see you guys peace all right we'll see you good night